What's happening, everybody? How the hell might y'all be doing out there? Today's episode of the Crash Bang Boom Drum Podcast has my occasional guest host, Chris Enriquez, who's also the drummer of Ipecac recording artist Spotlights, making a reappearance where he caught up with a killer drummer and one of my absolute favorites within the hardcore and punk rock realm, and David Sandstrom of Sweden's own Refused. But Chris and David got to talk about the appeal of David's unorthodox drumming, Dave Lombardo as a major influence, aches and pains of such a physical show, as well as some of the modern heavy bands that he's been loving, and a whole lot more. So check it out. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, my SoundCloud and YouTube pages, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and more. If you like what you hear, feel free to check out any of the previous 170 plus episodes. Give me a like, a subscription, a positive rating, and or a glowing review, and or all the above. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook as well for additional content and updates. So check it out. That would be killer. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking at releasing vinyl, go on over to NewOrleansRecordPress.com to look at the myriad vinyl coloring, packaging, mastering, electroplating, lacquer cutting, and more options. You can also use that handy little real-time quote generator to keep tabs on all your items, and they print both 12 and 7-inch records in both 150 and 180 gram variants. So give them a look-see. That's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. So here we go. David Sandstrom, Refused. Their most current record, War Music, is out everywhere, so get your hands up on it. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, 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 yep. What's up, everybody? This is your guest host, Chris Enriquez from Spotlights, and I have the great pleasure of hanging out here with David Sandstrom of Refused. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hello, my friend. Um, well, first of all, congratulations on your new record. Thank you. And uh, welcome back to Brooklyn. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, uh, you know, typically talk to a lot of uh, drummers that come out of the uh, underground scene, so it's just uh, perfect to have someone that I'm going to say is legendary, <laughs> in my opinion, even though I'm sure it feels weird to hear that. Yes, um, yes. And to, to those of you uh, who don't know, um, you know, The Refused has been around since the early 90s uh started out as a hardcore band and then um really evolved into something uh very unique which i don't even know what to call it uh you yeah know. i don't know what it is either <laughs> um whatever it is it definitely uh took uh no pun intended it took the whole punk rock idea and flipped it on its head and uh a lot of that is in due to um to the style of uh in my opinion and we were talking to drummers here the way that you play and that's uh what, what we want to talk to you about today. Uh, let me start uh, with this. What are your earliest memories of getting into music and how did you ultimately discover that drumming was your instrumental choice? Um, weirdly, uh, my earliest memory is playing the drums, um, hitting, um, my ma mom had these like tin cookie jars and I would flip them on their backs and and i would use uh, her knitting needles um and i would play them so it's uh, my earliest memory memory is being probably four there's a family mythology um where my mom says i was like not even three or whatever but i i think i was i was four or five but i got my first uh sort of toy drum set uh my granddad bought me when i was five so it's really been it's uh yeah, it's always been there. It's not su like it's not super unique. There are a lot of people like that, but I'm one of those. I could just play. I just went through my parents' entire record collection by the time I was like six or seven. Right, yeah, so you had a natural uh, fascination yeah. to it. And, and I got into metal when I was seven. When you started, like you said, you were like hitting things when you were like three or four years yeah. old and using the pots and pans, which yeah. is um, already kind of like showing that you I'm assuming are self-taught you yeah. were kind of just learning on your own at an organic way but um what at what po at what point were, were you like okay I'm gonna get a drum set I think I can do this and what was sort of the the um the the, the catalyst to that or or the or the music that you were playing yeah I, it, I, I was it was an obsession basically so I that was just what I was gonna do I always was gonna do that but I I, was, I didn't I don't think I thought of myself specifically as a drummer i just wanted to do music yeah. uh, and i didn't necessarily understand what that meant but i taught myself guitar early and i was i could sing i had pitch and stuff so i was just just 
naturally inclined well into my 20s was the first time I thought maybe I could do something more or something something else too but I'd never had any, any other thought in my entire life as an expression I yeah. guess that's sort of what you knew like oh, okay if, like everybody has their own way of getting uh, some people end up being athletes yeah and I'm sure there's some sort of therapy yeah. in that and yeah you know I think it, you could get derailed uh, and you're very lucky if you can keep that sort of um, mentality so far up in like in age but I, I did I just happened to everyone was sort of like my parents were working class and they didn't there was no like culture in my home okay. but they listened to American rock and roll they were in that sort of like nostalgia wave of uh, the Vietnam era where okay. America started like making love to the 50s and 60s and the birth of rock and roll so yes. it was it was going back to like Buddy Holly and so I grew up with that I grew up with like a lot of 50s uh, music although I'm bo born in 75 which is also like very like nursery rhymes they get stuck in your head they're not too hard to understand yeah and just like that the the I mean that's why punk rock made sense because the early the, it, it was basically the same as the early rock and roll right. that I grew up on um, so and also you know any like just rebellious music was always my thing like I was I, gonna say I loved like outrageous metal immediately and I just went the kind of thing where like when the new extreme thing popped up you were getting into that right and then you know like you went through from Priest to Metallica to Slayer and then <laughs> Napalm Death and then suddenly it was like you know fucking like drop dead like grind core right, right, like right. you you were just always looking for like the most insane when you're that obsessed there's so many moments of like musical inspiration that you can't really point at one because you're just going through it naturally yeah and you're just yeah. devouring everything was uh like who was the first drummer that, that sort of comes to mind that that you looked at and said wow. my mom was a bruce springsteen fan so i i really liked uh max weinberg and he hit hard and it's that part at the end of the born in the usa song and video where it's, he starts that like snare thing right to it's kick it it's to start it up again at the end yeah yeah sort of coda <laughs> and i remember seeing that and him like hitting really really hard on the snare right and being like this is fucking great it's a yeah it's a powerful instrument for yeah. sure and when you see something like that in a stadium because i think that was also a live yeah video sure yeah um that can have a quite an impact on a kid um, yeah and i don't know if we're around the same age but like that was the uh time that mtv played music it, on a regular basis yeah. and you were exposed to that stuff um you mentioned that you got into extreme music and metal and all that stuff were you ever um you know you were playing a a, a fairly stripped down kit uh and refused of course but was there ever a point when you were playing around with double bass drums <laughs> and like crazy yeah. uh you know yeah. a million cymbals yeah we were trying to be i mean my first real band we were i mean we played metallica covers um and we were we moved through the thrash thing into the death thing as that was starting. So we were like, sort of part of the second wave of Swedish death. So we yeah. like opened for this member ones, uh, but that's as far as we like we we weren't really we were slow writers, but we were just living <laughs> it, just like obsessed with with uh, with metal. That music just got it so got sort of tangled up in itself. Right. There was something about like hardcore punk to me that felt sort of like the blues like these they're ta speaking the truth they're you know talking about their lives and it's like right. it was it's so real to me and I was just like this is the thing because I was always very much into the lyrics and, and stuff yeah I mean with metal there was a lot of fantasy and, and things like that going yeah on I mean I, it's very rare that I uh, that I care that much about the lyrics of I, m I mean that's almost mean I love a lot of metal lyricists too but yeah. it's the genre I mean compared to like hip hop or like if you're listening to like Leonard Cohen or something the, the lyrics in metal are less important in the overall of course, yeah. you're, than you're, in many under more storytelling uh, yeah. street uh, yeah. culture and all that stuff um, and you know you also I noticed you know always had a jazz influence obviously I mean it's not even a little bit you you do have a very strong jazz uh, I guess um, yeah you know <laughs> probably yeah no, no yes sure sure um, no, but it's I don't I, I, I have a hard time I don't 
I don't know what I'm doing really. I don't, I don't think about it mm-hmm. really. It's just you're solving problems uh, as a drummer when you're writing the music, and I never think about the drum drums separately. I always think about just the song, what's going right. on, and and how the drums can function with and the music that we make. Of course, it's not you're not just like being the framework for the song. Like if you were in you know ACDC or if you were playing drums in like for some singer songwriter or something. on the floor. Yeah, like you're like really more of a heartbeat or a pulse. Which yeah, is like kind and of framing the you know like you're you're a, you're an integral part of the composition. But yeah. at the same time, I never think about it outside of that. So I when people say when you say that, yeah, I'm like that's great. I don't know. Yeah, right. right. Sure, but I did play a bit of jazz as a kid because we have in Sweden we have um, municipal music school which basically means that anyone can have their kid learn an instrument right which is very different from what we're used to here that that's a great resource to have yeah as a young yeah kid and if you're aware of like Swedish um, pop and Swedish songwriters I mean like so much of the stuff on like billboards top right. 10 is written by Swedes and stuff and there's so many great bands and musicians like disproportionately out of Sweden that's a big part of that is that anyone who has an inclination can uh, play an instrument in Sweden. Right. So there's there's really a surplus of of great uh, musicians and songwriters in Sweden. I mean, you definitely benefited off of that, obviously. Yeah. You know, yeah. which is cool. And you know, when we talk about the jazz influence, it's what's interesting to me is I I've watched you play a million times and. You know, and I mean this in the nicest way. I actually have some questions about it. It, do, it does seem like you're self-taught because you do a lot of stuff that um, I guess is not uh, orthodox. Right. Uh, and uh, I almost wonder. I mean, I'm going to reference something here, but you do a thing, and everyone talks about new noise. I'm sure you're sick of hearing about the same song all, all these years. But where a lot of stuff that you do technique-wise uh, are things that I think a drummer typically would do with two hands, but you're able to do. Uh, a lot of syncopated <laughs> stuff. It, it looks painful, but you do it every night. <laughs> yeah. Now, <it's, laughs> I don't know how how um, to ask this question or if it's going to translate the right way. But uh, is it a good thing that I make it look painful? No, it's great. I mean, you're <laughs> suffering for your art, I guess, right? <laughs> but like, I okay. Going back to this is why I'm asking you about how you learned and all that stuff. Because when I watch you play. It's incredibly technical, but I can also tell you kind of just found your own path, right? Honestly, um, and this is going to sound either really dumb or just like some sort of butchered Buddhism, but I, I genuinely think that what's good, what people find interesting or, you know, what they enjoy, I think, about my playing comes actually from the fact that I'm not that good at it. Uh, so there's so much stuff that I technically like stuff that I can't like right. I know million drummers like friends of mine who are in different bands that are just technically like far more advanced than I am since I could play just naturally kind of I never spent time practicing like I never I never ever ever play the drums I was going to ask you that too because that uh, particular uh, method that I yeah. was referencing seems like it would take a lot of practice to pull that off no I, I only got like like I got better once we when we because we toured a lot like the like these days like back in the day like people would play a bar and they'd play there for a month like they'd have like these solid jobs playing to people dancing like in the 60s 70s oh, right. but when you're in like a punk band who tours DIY you can just play every fucking night so we with Refuse we toured we could play like 150 shows in a year right and and somewhere in there is where I sort of picked it up like moved that's up a couple notches that's how I got a bit better um, beyond just what I naturally could do but then but I have to the thing is I just have to invent uh, interesting things to do when I can't actually do the the whatever the snare roll or <laughs> you know like the technical sure, yeah. logical thing to do or whatever so then I have to come up with a solution and those solutions are always sort of maybe odd or something I just do something uh, Off cuff. You, it, well, yeah. it sounds like a lot of impro. Um, ir- yeah. So then you notice yeah. that, and you're like, "Oh, that's interesting." And but it's not necessarily just like a um, uh, an eccentric choice that I make. It's just that I I'm not that good at playing the drums. So I have to. <laughs> I have but to by do the something else. Of, so uh, I the guess fact like, that I'm yeah. bad is what makes me good. That's what I meant by the stupid. Like I think I understand what you're saying. You know, but uh, you know, and it's also like kind of um, 
when you when you when you go by the book, I guess when there's rules, right? But yeah. there really are no rules. Some of yeah. our some of the best uh, punk bands, specifically, I mean, if you listen to like Talking Heads or something like yeah. that, or like the Velvet Underground, I mean, these are some of the best bands yeah. uh, out there. But you know, clearly, we're never schooled. Generally, I think interesting musicians very often are their pr maybe their main instrument used to be something else, right? And they have, and for some reason, they just started because of like someone else was playing that instrument in the <laughs> band and they had to play something else. I think very often when I like someone, I f find out that, oh, I was actually a bass player. Right. And then it's like, oh, and then you started playing the keyboards or then I just started like. So I, that leads me to another question I want to ask about songwriting because I feel like you are pretty um, active in the collaboration role, uh, whereas some bands, you know, are kind of led by one guy or two. Yeah, people. I write a lot of the stuff. But uh, before we get into that though and step off this stuff, like, do you did, were there were there like any particular drummers growing up? If you had to like take three names out of a hat that like ins were I mean, inspiring, it's, it's Dave Lombardo. I mean, definitely Ulrich on Master of Puppets, but also Nicky from Entombed. Wow, uh, was a huge influence. Uh, but yeah, Lombardo is the one. He's the main. Guy. I mean, he is the master. We. Uh, I mean, it's. Yeah. I think it's. Honestly, I think it's almost. It's too obvious in my playing that I mean the the my f style of doing fills is just basically just a rip off. What's interesting about that is a lot of people seem to reference Dave Lombardo for speed all the time, which of course everyone knows he can you know keep up a, 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 a yeah. an entire three hour concert yeah. and just playing like this. No, but uh, it's the mambo counter rhythms that he does on the fills because he can play fast and then the fill comes and then it's like all these like like counter rhythm, rhythms that you're yeah. used to hearing like on congas or something in like mambo music and like cuban, cuban music yeah yeah and, it's and from that's there that's interesting there's a couple of videos of him online uh doing these like interesting like i don't know if it's guitar center sessions yeah. but he's actually playing with conga players and uh, yeah he started um experimenting outside of uh metal i think once he was uh ejected from slayer right or whatever happened there but uh he does have a, a way of playing fills that I, you stole the words yeah. right out of my mouth that are so interesting that you don't see or hear with other thrash drummers yeah um, and we actually me and chris we i mean we, we've always been obsessed with slayer but we, around that time when we were making shape of punk we were actually listening to a lot of mambo music was well, a lot going on in that yeah because uh, because chris was also a drummer uh, the guitar player yep. and we we write the music and uh, he was um, in the same municipal music school. Okay. So we had the same teacher, and, and we were in the same uh, percussion ensemble when we were kids, like nine. Or, I was nine, and he was ten. Is that where you were able to pick up? Like, you have a very impressive ride cymbal um, way of just sort of playing all those jazzy parts on the record. Oh, right. Would you say that it was in that school that you kind of figured out? Yeah, how they to sort play of. It way? was sort of like no, it was like I was a I was a problem child um, of sorts. And uh, I didn't care for school, so I didn't basically didn't do school. I mean, I was there, but I just sat there. I just yeah. didn't do any homework, or I didn't f write things on the tests. I just, I was just very, and I was very confrontational. Punk rock kid. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. I mean, just <laughs> I don't know, just some ADHD thing or something. I don't know, but uh, so it was this like through the music school. The drum teacher wanted to help me out, uh, get me like some work you know because i dropped out of school when i was 15 and and so one of the things was like if you work here you have to play in like the the little orchestra they had mm -hmm. there so i played sh like you know like percussion sheet music and stuff uh and i was also in this like jazz workshop thing and, and did you know ah, so, so that, that's sort of but i didn't from. it wasn't this, that i i got into jazz later listening to stuff and that i i did i I didn't do that voluntarily, really. It was just that I, I could fill in my own timetable at, at the job because I was like some sort of like janitor, but I didn't do shit. <laughs> he was just helping me out so I could have like a year off after dropping out of school, basically. Kind of like a filler. Yeah, right? but in mean. order for him to do me that favor, I had to do these other things for him. So basically, I, I picked up. I didn't realize it, of course. I, just, I was just standing there like, oh, fuck, this sucks. Mm. And I wanted to go play metal with my friends. But then later in life, of course, I noticed that stuff had seeped in there was stuff i'd, I'd been doing You're like oh I, I i didn't realize that was going to come out exactly in my songwriting so right. it's a lot of happy accidents it yeah like. of course 
um, which is crazy because, I mean, do you practice that much on your own or is it? No, never, you ever, don't. ever. I, I, don't, I mean, I can relate to that, but I it's hard to believe. I don't ever yeah. play the drums, <laughs> ever. I don't yeah. think of myself as a drummer. Right. Even. That's really, it's really, it's really uh, crazy to hear because the, um, the things that you do, while well, I guess they are probably coming natural and almost effortless right. to an outsider, which, you know, of course, uh, everybody has in all aspects of their life the way that their sort of mind and body operate and you can never really compare one to the other but it is really interesting to watch and hear this because right. i would watch you play these jazzy parts and some of the fills that you do and the um sort of syncopated uh uh parts with both both hands at the right. same time i'm like man and to top it off uh which is about equipment now you don't really play you play heavy music but your drums and your cymbals and even your sticks are relatively and you correct me if i'm wrong not like that big like you have no. kind of like almost i play seven a's yeah, yeah very skinny yeah but you just beat the shit out of your yeah stuff and it really yeah. you push it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is it because is there a, is there a, um what's the thinking there it's another boring stupid uninspired answer but i think i don't think i'd enjoy it like i don't think i could be bothered to do it unless i could like have that crazy like visceral adrenaline fueled experience it's like it's, it's 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 narcotic so every night i just work myself up to like this absolute frenzy and i just i just yeah i just go fucking crazy oh i've seen because you punch, otherwise uh, you've punched through right. snare drums yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah no but that's what it is really like i don't i don't think i'm i'm like as an ident identity as a musician I don't think I am a drummer but and I only play with this band I don't play I've never yeah, really it's, played it's almost like performance art the way you describe it anyway, <laughs> which is I mean no I but it's like it, it, a band is like this, this strange thing like so much stuff can happen in your life and you can go in all these directions personally but if you're in a band and the band is sort of just plodding along in the, you know it's still the band so whether you like sometimes you feel like maybe I don't want to do this, but you can't not do it because it's your because then you're. I'm not saying I don't. You know, I really love writing music with this band and stuff. And the live show is almost like a religious experience. It's right. so intense to play with these guys. But I I don't th I'm not like a band. I don't go around like oh I'm the guy from that band. I don't think I almost like in my private life I almost forget that I'm well that's a a that's guy in a band that people know who he is maybe like that that never I'm always surprised. That someone knows who I am or, or I seriously I mean that's also a total, yeah. like it's more of an ego thing where you get no, I, I have a huge stuff, ego it's yeah. not I think but I just <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's it's just that um, I think a lot of people it's that it's a lifestyle like you're the guy who play you play in a band and that's what that's your identity and right, it's just not, it just doesn't are. happen to be the way I think of myself so there's something about what we and we do it so seldom too so you can really just I mean I told someone just now on the street a friend that I feel like Jeff Goldblum in the fly uh, during tour because every morning there's something new that's wrong with my body from the night before right. from the show so now I have like this blood filled blister uh, on my heel like under my foot oh my god that I don't even understand from the sh just from the show yesterday in DC I have on no your idea on your bass drum foot yeah yeah I don't know because I don't hit this I never I, I play with you know the top of my I don't play with my heel down. Uh, yeah, even. yeah. Most people, it's in the air all the time, so I have no idea how that occurred. And then there's something with my back now. It's like all weird and crooked. It feels. Yeah. And then you know, like how Jeff Goldblum in The Fly, like he looks in the mirror and he like removes <laughs> like a teeth and some nail. That's how I feel. Right, right. Every right. day there's something new, that's really fucked up. And then my you know hands start bleeding, and then it's the like shoulder gets you know. Well, I see you got some bandages on, but yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, hey, that's punk as fuck, right? I mean. You you could very much be the uh, Gigi Allen of drumming if you want to. <laughs> no, but I I, I, also, I I don't know. Sometimes I mean it's a part of this music that we make that you look at that I'm really really punishing the drums and it becomes part of. I mean that's how the songs are arranged to like pummel you and to get your adrenaline going. Like it is it is a phys very physical music. So so it works well um, yeah. visually um, with what we do. But I do believe actually I I would. Like if we were recording, I would play a lot better if I didn't do that. Yeah, it's just then I think I'd get bored and stuff. Playing in the studio 
is obviously such a different experience yeah. too. And I listen to, um, I feel like I'm in the last two records, you know, and I could be wrong, but um, you're doing some overdubs and some triggers maybe and stuff like that. Whereas on some of the earlier records, it seems like you were kind of more just, uh, you know, doing it live and maybe taking yeah. some samples and splicing. Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing that's funny about us being famous for that record, which is such a studio record, The Shape of Punk Could Come, I mean, um, such a studio record with all these like sort of experimental stuff going on. Um, the thing was before that, uh, the reason we were so driven and did, did it that way was because we were so bad in the studio. So all the, like, we were always, like, in, back in Sweden in the early days, people were like, you're the, such a great live band. People loved us. But then when our recordings, like our first demos, our first mini CD, like, first full length, people were like, all our friends were just like, you just can't get it right in the studio. Like, we were really bad. And we were restless. I think we have, like, some sort of collective ADD thing going on. <laughs> like, we, we would just do a take, and they're like, yeah, it's fine. And then, you know, Dennis was always like, Either we were coming from tour, so he was like hoarse, or, you know, his voice was fucked up. All the early records, he was like either had a cold or... Right. So he sang weird and we played bad. Like, we were so bad in the studio. Um, and then when we made that record, me and Chris were just like, this time around, we're going to really, really... Hone it in. Yeah, do it. We're going to actually, like, get it right. I and mean, then we went difference. very overboard in the other other direction. Like, it, it got... It was a very... Uh, it became a very overwrought thing. The evolution of the band is very cool because some bands kind of, I mean, some bands are meant to stay one way. You know, you referenced right. ACDC earlier, but, yeah. um, you know, then there are some bands that I think sort of evolve in a way that makes sense and you want to see them evolve. Right. You don't want that same record. And you guys have done that, I think, with the last two records. And it's awesome to see that you're just not just sort of trying to recreate right. what you once did. But which, once again, I think that that's also something about we us some of us probably being on the spectrum is that i don't think we we couldn't be like if we tried to do some sort of repetition of something else that we'd done i don't think we'd even finish a record we just get like oh this is oh shit because we we're we suffer enough just making <laughs> trying to stuff yeah yeah just being like the stuff that we really want to get right this is painful enough but to do something that wasn't I don't think we could really. Yeah. Well, and I'm, and yeah. also I'm not necessarily sure that we knew what we were doing. Like now, even trying to, if we were to make a new record and and try to recreate what we did with War Music, I don't think we could because we, it's very much intuitive. It's still the way that you guys always did everything. Yeah. As a group. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I think with certain bands they want to evolve, and and I I I just think that we 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 just, uh, we just can't give. Like, if, if there's a thing that people want from us, I think we're just simply incapable of giving that to You're them. You're not the band that can sort we of... We just can't. Yeah. Like, well, even if we really, really way. wanted to, we, 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 we couldn't do it. You mentioned um, earlier that you were a part of, you know, as a drummer, you're also a big part of the writing process. Is there a typical method of how you guys get together and put your, yeah, you know, your thinking caps it's on? It's usually me and Chris, just alone, for the most part. Um, that's just even this record we we started out doing a, you know trying to be in the same room but it's me and Chris have a thing because we've known each other for so we're from the same part of town and we've played we've been into m a lot of the same music and and uh, we just have a certain chemistry when we write and since he's a drummer we switch back and forth a lot I was gonna ask you that too he writes this there's the song either starts with uh, me or me having a riff and him or him having a riff and then we build it from there. And either sometimes he takes my riff and runs with it, or I take his riff and run with it. And then when you guys... Or, or we come with like almost like a finished song, and then he helps me figure it out. Complete it. And arrange it, and, or I do it for him. But that's usually... And then once it's something, we bring in um, like Dennis and the other guys. Like there's, there's always... Like I don't think Dennis has ever heard like just a riff. Right. He he hears a he actual hears when song. It's, no, no, but like if there's two parts, like you, we can play a riff and then go into the other thing, and then he's and and then I mean it's re, it's very important that he <laughs> likes it too. Oh, well, and of course, I'm sure very, there have been people at that, that point. Veto yeah, I mean things. then everyone has. It's not a dictatorship. Um, all good ideas reign, so then everyone's important. Yeah. 
but it's just like it's usually it's usually because when it's strange but when i have something i want chris to hear it and and it's the same for him he needs me to hear it and and so he can he can tell me that he has a riff <laughs> he's like this teaser like <laughs> right <laughs> like like uh he would just tell me like he has a riff and i'm like oh, interesting we talk about it but i don't get to hear it then and then he'll, he'll talk <laughs> about it more and we'll talk on the phone about this thing he has but it could, sometimes it takes like a week or two before i actually hear the riff well if you see it as a tease then i guess that means that you really trust your writing partner so that you know it's going to be something you're excited to hear yeah yeah no no i know if he says he has a riff then i know it's going to be good you 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 mentioned a lot of um the way that you describe a lot of uh, the band and you as a musician almost uh, in this like happy accident kind of way. Right. Uh, knowing uh, that Shave of Punk to Come was such a legendary record that inspired even like I can name a lot of famous people that have uh, talked mm -hmm. about uh, what an impact that record had on them from like the guys in Guns N' Roses when they were in Velvet Revolver to the right. guys in Metallica. Is there any... Uh, What's the? What are some of the most? I'm gonna ask you to name drop, I guess. But like, what are the some of the most surreal or weirdest moments when it came to like drummers, particularly where a, a, a drummer you might have looked up to or a famous drummer came up to you and said, "Wow, you really inspired me," or like that record means a lot to me, and you're such a good drummer. Where you were like, "Holy shit, really?" Yeah. Uh, have you ever had any of those kind of moments? <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's two, two maybe two stories. But one was just when we were on tour in Australia and our Australian tour manager uh, was also Slayer's Australian tour manager and he was texting with uh, Lombardo we were last night of a tour we were at some bar after the last show and apparently Lombardo he said he was with Refused and he said a he great drummer heavy band I think he, he responded and uh, I was so pleased that I drank one and a half <laughs> bottles of red wine and I, then I took a took a Talk on a guy's spliff and uh, passed out and smashed my teeth in the concrete pavement oh and I had to go God. to the, uh, the hospital. <laughs> Have you ever got to tell him that? <laughs> no, actually, I've, I've declined. I've had opportunities to meet, uh, twice meet people in Slayer, but I've actually declined because I don't, I don't want to think about when I put, you know, Seasons in the Abyss on or... I don't want to think about like oh Tom or I smelled nice or something like or, <laughs> so it's know, not it even a negative thing but yeah no 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 yeah, no yeah, nothing yeah. no it just oh Jeff Hanneman was funny or something you know I don't sure. I just want it to be what it is like it's sort of important to me but then um, we played the when we did the reunion 2012 we played the Jimmy Fallon uh, show that he had the one he had in New York I saw the, I saw that on was, television right actually I think I played a show with you afterwards with my other band Primitive Weapons at St. Vitus and you used my drum set <laughs> right yes right I just put that two together right yeah no but then um, we'd sound checked in during the day and then when we got there in the evening to, or like later in the day when we were supposed to do the thing we were just sitting in this dressing room I didn't realize we were just right behind where we were gonna play so they just opened this door and it was like the filming of the the TV show and it ha it was such a busy day it hadn't occurred to me that Roots was his um, oh, yeah. fucking band so Quest I walk love. out and sit down by the drum set and look over and like whatever like 10 meters from me Questlove is sitting by his right. drum set looking right <laughs> at me and just like nodding and I'm like oh my fucking <laughs> lord right. I'm gonna play the drums right in front of Amir Questlove Thompson. Right, who's played on everything. Yeah, and also like huge fan of like I he I I saw Roots in 1999 in in Stockholm. I I really really uh, loved them. So and him in particular like his strange strange way of playing the drums. Yeah. So I was just like it was very strange. Yeah. So it, the whole thing of like playing on a TV show or whatever and the P, there were other famous like it all like there's an actor sitting over there yeah, and then it's like the roots I was just like that's Fallon. Questlove right and, uh, and then he tweeted something like refused just kill the Jimmy Fallon show or something right that's cool man I, I wouldn't put it past him for if he actually is a fan and as is aware sure, those sure. Guys, he seems like I a think, super music nerd like yeah but, but it was just so I mean it's it's weird when you when there's someone who's so fucking good at it right and you sit down and you feel like this like just inbred potato farmer who's just got <laughs> I mean I actually <laughs> felt like, uh, so what am I doing here? in this weird um, uh, conversation I'm having with you 
which is unplanned. I actually played here with Mr. Bungle last week, and Dave oh, Lombardo played. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. opened up for them, and his drum set was right behind me. Right. I just wanted to touch it, but uh, I, I never said hi to him. Right. I don't know if it was for the same reasons, but I kind of just get weird. And, and he was walking around by the dressing rooms, but I didn't even bother to, right. to say, hey, it's nice to meet you. You're awesome. Yeah, but, but it's also yeah. like, I mean, it's nice to, I mean, it would be nice to tell him because, I mean, I've studied him. I, I could more or less get through <laughs> most of Slayer like if you were just to wake me in the middle of the night and sit set, and they were there and they we would start a song I could right. basically get through them like play the actual fills I mean I air drum like exactly what he's doing like well a, you guys do a little so snippet of Slayer in the of middle course, of yes, uh, one of your songs yes. but, uh, but uh, yeah I'm so obsessed so it would, would be nice to tell him you know just because that's nice to hear for, for, for anyone but at the same time you feel like there's nothing what the, I've never felt like what's the you know you see someone and it's like yeah that person is great that's great but right. I don't feel the need to it's like you see a moose come out of the forest and I don't feel the need to ride it or touch it sure sure I just no, like I totally oh there it is fascinating yeah. great yeah like if I love that's Phil it. Collins as an artist I don't need to hang out and get coffee with him yeah you know? yeah. Um, yeah now we spent a lot of time on um, guys that inspired you and I think we figured out who one of your favorite drummers is from yes. back in the day are there um newer bands or new drummers right now that are exciting to you yeah i mean i'm i'm uh, like all musicians just obsessed with i mean i i mean I'm, i mentioned lombardo because he towers just for the kind of music that we make and it's so obvious how much i've taken from him but of course there's thousands and thousands of drummers that i like yeah. and i like you know, I love Ralph Molina from Crazy Horse, and he can barely <laughs> play the drums. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Subtlety. Yeah, and I and I still, still to this day, I I I I've been going through this metal phase. So I'm listening to a lot of great. Um, of course, these days I don't bother to, you know, figure out the names necessarily of people, and I don't hardly know the song like titles anymore. You a new band that's cool, but you don't. But I listen to. Drummer. I mean, the Cattle Decapitation guy is fucking. Oh yeah. That fucking record is. Uh, what is it? Blood Atlas, the new one, the latest yeah. one? It's unbelievable. I think they just played with He's Mr. Bungle. Too, yeah, they like did. I actually yeah, wanted. Did. To, they were. They did this like Bungle tribute shirt that was like vomit green, yes. cattle decapitation shirt that I tried to get a friend in LA to get for me because I really, really <laughs> wanted. I don't, I'm not sure it, it happened, but I love them. I love uh, uh, Tate on Blood, this black metal outfit, Imperial Triumphant. I think they're from here, from yeah, Brooklyn, yeah. this black metal band too. I love um, Blood Incantation. I oh, love that Vol is a great band. It's a band called Volon from LA. It's like a Guatemalan American dude. There's this like black metal circle circle there called Crepusculo yeah. Negro. And there's two bands in that, that collective that I like. It's a band called Blue Hummingbird on the left. And they're also one of those like weird, so vibey. Right. Uh, but it, they're not like excellent musicians or anything. But it's really, really good stuff. So yeah, no, I, l I love I love a lot of um, extreme stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I l I like a lot of extreme metal. What's, uh, what's yeah, sort Vitriol of are good. That's a good band. Yeah, yeah. They're a bit almost too because I like it when it's kind of rough and raw, and they're very like precise and very technical. Well, what you do is very primitive and raw as well. I um, yeah, I hope so. I yeah. try to. Yeah, what else? I mean, I, I listen to so much fucking metal these days. It's ridiculous. The new, the latest Dark Throne, I thought was... I mean, oh, last yeah. year was an incredible year for metal. Well, also, Just heavy ridiculous. music is at an all-time high right now. Yeah. Especially here in Brooklyn. Oh, the f have you heard the Japanese band Friendship? I have not. Most oh, of the bands you mentioned, I'm already aware of. Oh, my fucking God. I'll have to check them out. Yeah, they you yeah. really, really... They, they are fucking amazing. Well, it makes me happy to know that you still are um, out in the underground paying attention to what's going on right you know what i mean yeah um you know because there's so much good stuff like in heavy music right now yeah, it's a golden age for metal in general it is and you the, know people the fucking like gridlink complain. dudes have a new band like the discordance axis guys okay yeah no I one axis. knows what the dead think i think they're called they put out a record last year too that's really i mean very much in that vein in that but vein very yeah. very good i like it um, Thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all relatable too, yeah. and I think that we also um, got a good idea of really like for anyone out there that's curious about you as a drummer and where you're coming from. You know, like I think that this is just a very great way for people to see that you can actually think outside of the box 
and you know take from different places and create your own unique way of doing things because a lot of technical drummers and i think that this podcast is a little different because we interview people in the underground mainly in a lot of aggressive music um is that you know it's not like guitar center where you're going and listening to like all these session guys that are like right. talking about rudiments and crazy stuff and that's something that's really special about you as a player and why we wanted you as a guest so oh, it was enlightening and they were not uninspired answers by any means it's who you are <laughs> and uh, and that's what we wanted to get to thank know. you i'm glad yeah. um i know you have sound check coming up uh, and we've I had do, you yeah, for a bit sure. but uh two two quick questions uh i would say like do you have any advice for anyone listening that might be you know a younger or just aspiring drummer that wants to get out there and start making uh music that people will pay attention to and, and they're just trying to get their voices heard i don't give a shit about what anyone thinks that's a simple yeah that's it yeah. just don't give a shit yeah no you know, I, I agree with you never. once you start thinking about uh no but i mean you you you'll miss out on some really good uh advice too i suppose but somehow just getting there by your own you know ideas is the most important thing it's very very easy to lose track of like your inner voice, like what actually gets you going. And then you're, if, you, if you're in a scene with other people and stuff like that, you sort of want them to see you and you want validation from other people in the music scene or whatever. But it's, it's, I think it's really, really important to actually not care. Like really don't give a shit. Like really don't. That's what I think. Well, that's great advice. And, yeah. and when you don't... Uh lose the essence of why you got into something in the first place right. and what it why it means something and, to and, you. And, and, my, and my I think it, this is also maybe not a pop, like an encouraging answer but don't do it for a living right because that's not fun <laughs> I'll take it it's from you. very yeah, insecure yeah, yeah. it's a yeah. very insecure life I, I don't want my it, daughter it. to be in I mean I can't control if she wants she'll do whatever the fuck she wants but I wouldn't. I would rather she did wasn't in music. It is a. It's a hard, weird, uh, not very stable yeah. uh, existence. I, I I definitely know where you're coming from, and it just dawned on me that, you know, while I was on tour last week, you spent 23 hours, uh, you know, kind of like doing a bunch of stuff and mostly sitting around right. for that one hour that you yeah. get to uh, sort of. Uh, get your art out there yeah. and even when you're doing really well there's something that strange. makes sense about that too like like in a sort of like you know how predators like owls don't fly right. unless their stomachs are empty because of course they're when they've just eaten they're heavy right. so they, they don't want to spend the energy uh, flying around so they just basically sit until they need to eat again basically they just don't move that is a very <laughs> interesting comparison yeah. and that so, mean, I mean it, it makes a lot of sense yeah, a lot of times say just some small town um, in the Midwest or something like it's not unusual that you're better there than you were in New York because in New York you had all these friends hanging out and you went to an interesting museum or you had some great fucking food you know like all this stuff going on but if you're in a city where it's like a couple of streets there's one bookstore right then you're just like sitting there just like and when you walk up on stage you really need to connect and you need to fucking destroy yeah. and murder that night because the whole fucking day was like a wash that's brutal yeah. and if you're not if you don't fucking destroy that show then the whole day is just like f and then you're that's a you know you're in a negative spiral and it'll affect the rest of the tour so very often you're like fucking like you're okay you're good in new york but you're fucking great in like butt fuck michigan yeah no david you're uh your way of, of, of going about things is very inspiring and relatable because I think that at least uh, I can speak from as a musician, it is a therapeutic right. release. And that's why I uh, think a lot of people in punk rock and hardcore get into it, particularly in those genres and right. certainly metal. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've always been a fan. I'm just really happy I got to sit and talk to yeah, you. It's and great to see you your again, history. Man. It's great to see yeah. you too. Um, and I'm gonna plug your new album, War Music which is out now on Spine Farm Records. Yeah, it's a doozy. And, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a fantastic record. Thank and, you. And um, at a time right now, I think that uh, uh, Refused is a very important band to have existing out there because you guys have something to say. And uh, make sure you pick it up if you haven't heard it already. It's on all streaming. And make sure you watch the band live. They're going to be touring for a while. And thank you so much for making time to speak with us Thanks, today. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. All right. 
All right, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and thanks as always for tuning in. Thanks to Chris for guesting and David for chatting. And we'll catch y'all on the next one. Stay tuned. Crash, bang, boom. <laughs>